we're going to do LOMRIM for your last two semesters. And it's really amazing to get to do the whole LOMRIM kind of start to finish, not missing any of the topics. They're all topics pretty much that you've touched on at some point in the past. So it shouldn't be brand new material. It should be more integrating material that you've already touched. Occasionally, there'll be something new that maybe didn't get covered in previous semesters. But generally speaking, um, these are really integration semesters. So what we have for you is Practicing the Path by Yang Zi Rinpoche, which is a very comprehensive modern commentary on the Lam Rim Chenmo the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa. So Yang Zi Rinpoche is still alive. He's a contemporary Lama. And um, this is edited teachings that he gave live. So it's a really wonderful text. And uh, both myself and SK will use it during our semesters. Don't worry, we're not going to say read all of it start to finish. I know it's a great big fat book. I'll say, you know, like these two pages about this topic. But it means that you have access to really comprehensive teachings on all of the main subjects. And this can kind of be your friend after the human spirit program finishes, because you can go back and look over a lot of the main topics and find um, things that you want to clarify or remember. So it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, Talmud Bible, something or other, you know, it's got uh, really excellent content. Um, you know, we could have gotten you the Lam Rim Chenmo in English itself, which is a relatively contemporary translation, but it's it's so technical that only some of it makes sense without context, whereas a commentary, it's already giving context. So that's why we've chosen this. So practicing the path, um, every, if everybody has it with them, that's great. If you don't, I'll try to remember to do share screen. Um, but I just want us to look on page three and four for a second and just look at um, some of Yangtze Rinpoche's advice. So he says two important things that I would like you to keep in mind. The first is that it is essential that you try to integrate these teachings with your mind. There should not be a gap between your mind and the teachings at any point. If there is such a gap, Although it may be possible for you to derive some sort of intellectual understanding of the teachings, you will not be able to apply them to your experience and you will not get very far on the path. If, however, you receive teachings on the Lam Rim with a firm intention to put them into practice and improve your mind, you will be building a house with a perfect foundation and you will reap the rewards later on. The second point that you should consider is your motivation to receive these teachings. If you do virtuous activities with attachment or with a mind distracted by the eight worldly concerns, the results will not be pure. If you engage in violent activities without compassion, even in the context of your tantric practice, these activities become non-virtuous. If you take teachings on the profound path of wisdom or the extensive path of method with thoughts of pride or jealousy, you otherwise positive actions become polluted. As Lama Tisha says, if the roots of the plant are poisonous, then the trunk, the branches, the leaves, the flowers, and the fruit will also be poisonous. And when the roots of the tree are medicinal, the rest of the tree will be medicinal as well. In the same way, if your motivation is rooted in non-virtue and negativity, your actions will become non-virtuous. And if your motivation is rooted in the wish to benefit others, your actions will be beneficial as well. So we just want to really click into that positive motivation for doing this really profound study. And so because we're doing Lam Rim, um, I thought it would be useful if we did a Lam Rim prayer to start each session, just to keep all of the topics tidy in our mind to reinforce their order and to remember them. So we'll use the foundation of all good qualities to start and to set our motivation. So if you'd like to recite along in English or else just really think deeply and contemplate the meaning, this foundation of all good qualities was written by Lama Tsongkhapa. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to him is the root of the path. 
By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon him with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities, and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pratamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, Please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows and samaya. As I have become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, May I quickly attain the state of Ajadara. And so just imagining your mind connecting with the whole Lamrim. Okay, so um, I want to introduce you to how very cool your textbook is and um, how user-friendly it is. So if you want to look kind of in the very beginning, and if you just want to look at the table of contents all the way down where it says appendix, outline of the text, this is going to be really useful. So you have the introduction to the text, the four methods to teach the Lamrim, brief history of the Lamrim, qualities of the Lamrim, how to teach it, opening stanzas. And then you have the greatness of the author. So we start with Lama Atisha and Lama Tsongkhapa and the greatness of the Dharma, how to listen and 
teach the Dharma. These are some very familiar things we've talked about a lot, like the three faults of a container, right? Not being a leaky pot or an upturned pot, et cetera. And the discriminating attitudes, like seeing yourself as a sick person and the Dharma as medicine and how to teach the Dharma. And then we get into the actual content of the Lam Rim. So this appendix um, has the outline of all the main topics within the Lam Rim, and this is going to be really useful for seeing kind of where you're going and where you've been. And so um, if you're wanting to review any sections, I know that often there's a lot of conversations around karma. This section on cause and effect is going to have a lot of um, details about karma that I think will be really interesting to you guys. We'll probably get to it during this semester, but if we don't, just know that it's there. And um, so anyway, rely on that outline, which is in the back of your book. Okay, so it's going to be really useful. And when we're looking at Lam Rim, um, it's so important now at this stage in your study to really ask yourself every single class, how does this apply to me specifically? You know, it's, it's natural to think, oh, this really applies to my children or my partner and my spouse and my clients. But if you can just really consistently keep bringing it back to how does this apply to me and my life, it's going to be a much deeper practice. And then it'll have a flow on effect of then how can I use this to benefit other people? But if you don't take the Lam Rim as personal advice, it's sort of inappropriate to use it as advice for other people even implicitly or indirectly, you know, so you have to start with this is personal advice. You can take it or leave it. You don't have to take all of the advice, but try and hear it as this is all of the teachings of the Buddha kind of put into order for practice by people that have lived it. And Lama Tsongkhapa in particular was such an amazing scholar practitioner that he was able to draw from all of the main historical texts, to draw from his own meditative experience that he could draw from his life experience. It's, it's really amazing what Lama Tsongkhapa was able to accomplish in this text because the teachings of the Buddha are 108 volumes. Remember, he lived for like 40 years from his enlightenment to his death. So there's this huge amount of content that the Buddha put out and the fact that Lama Tsongkhapa was able to get all of the main topics tidy and then to put them in order in terms of practice it was an elegant and an incredibly efficient thing that he was able to do for us. So, um, so it's a really beautiful thing. But if you're starting to feel like, oh, wow, the Lam Rim has so much, I just made a little one-page outline, which I think I've even shown you guys in the past. Here is everything all the main points. Okay. So it's divided into preliminaries, initial scope, medium scope, and great scope. All of your topics are divided that way. So the preliminaries, correctly relying on a spiritual friend and developing the characteristics of a reliable student, how to meditate and how to act between sessions and perfect human rebirth. And the goal of the preliminaries is to make this life meaningful by pursuing a spiritual path. So basically avoiding being hooked by the eight worldly concerns. So last semester, you spent a lot of time on that first topic, relying on a spiritual teacher. And I'm curious what parts intrigued you and what parts challenged you. When you th th think about the guru devotion thing in Tibetan Buddhism, that whole premise, what strikes you as either interesting or troubling? 
just that uh, it is so hard for us as uh, lay people to find uh, a spiritual teacher, a guru, so we can devote to, to being their student. Yeah, it, it, I understand that it is challenging to, to know, I guess, what to look for and how to look. What to look for and how to look? Is that the challenge? Or, or is the challenge something else? Just that, that should I not, even devote? No, no, no. That it's not approachable to us. Because? It's, because it's, I don't know, it's, uh, we need, <laughs> we don't have teachers here in Israel which are gurus we can devote to. So access. Access? Yeah. Hey, um, I find it difficult to uh, uh, think about a guru or uh, uh, to, uh, as a secular, not religion Buddh- Buddhist, as uh, someone who learned studying Buddhism from a more secular standpoint, from more philosophical, so forth, I found it hard even to think about it. I mean, the concept of guru. I have many other people that are uh, aspiration for me, but the concept of guru was, I found it hard to to include in my life. Do you think it's because um, it, it seems to ask a level of trust that doesn't feel practical? Or what, what do you think is the resistance? You know, or is it common sense that has seen you know, weird cults and things on documentaries and goes, no? Or, um... I'm not used to think as one person to be the one who is my aspiration. I, it's easier for me to think of many people around me that I are aspiration, inspire me. And the concept of one person was a little bit strange for me. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And just, you know, side note, you can have more than one. But yeah, I, I hear you there. <laughs> I hear you there. Yeah, yeah. What else came up for you guys? I'm curious how it landed because it is a, uh, it's a different way of looking at, I guess, practice, scholarship. You know, it's different than a mentor, and some people have resistance even to mentors or supervision or you know, <laughs> you know, so much relies upon um, trust in your own ability to hear superior wisdom. Hi. Uh, hey. <laughs> yeah. What else came up? I, I wanted to say that the, since the, the the previous semester, there 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 is a feeling that that even in the two points that you have read today, there is a feeling that n- now I feel that I'm in a stage where really a guru is needed to carry on practice. Uh, now, now the difficulty is is uh, first of all uh, it 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 require a belief, real belief and and uh, and commitment and the the question that arises is the trust. How can I trust when because it's it's to give yourself to the to give much more the self for this spiritual path. Yeah, yeah, it's healthy hesitancy, <laughs> sounds like, <laughs> healthy hesitancy. And maybe also some afflicted hesitancy too. It's it's complex, you know, what what is it that makes us want to rely? And what of that is wisdom driven? And what of that is afflictive? And it's a rich place to explore, I think. And it's not like it's a finished thing, like you get your teacher and then it's done. You know, it's not like, I don't know, you guys are mostly married, I think. Yeah, it's not like you got married and then the relationship was like stamped and now it is this exact thing every single day, day to day. It's a it's an evolving, changing thing, even though you've made a commitment for a lifetime. 
still there's evolution within that relationship, I'm guessing, yes. You know, so, so too it is with the guru. It's not like it's this static thing. The trust deepens over time. But how do you make the initial commitment? That is, that's a very interesting place to explore the initial commitment. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, look, do you see the, I guess, there, there's a like faith-based, for lack of a better word, type of feeling within the relationship, but it's faith-based in self-trust. Like you have to have a very awakened inner guru for you to recognize an outer guru, you know, that, what is that old cliche, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true that when you have an inner guru that is alert, <laughs> alert and well-developed, you hear guru-ness from everywhere. And then if that guru-ness were to be personified in one person, you would recognize that quickly. But even if you were to recognize it quickly in one individual, it doesn't mean that you then jump to commit, you know, it's like, I don't know, you could have love at first sight, but still you want to check, you know, and make sure is this really a good fit? Or am I just riding the wave of some chemical response or some, you know, reminiscing or nostalgic feeling they're reminding me of something parental or they're reminding me of something, you know, I don't know, hope for divine. You know, so, so it's like you're, you're trying to navigate feelings of being inspired, feelings of having aspirational ideas together with a very grounded reasonableness within yourself, a very deep and profound common sense. You know, and so marrying up those two things, one which is very romantic and very mystical and very transcendent with something that is very grounded and logical and practical. You know, this is, this is what we're trying to do with the guru devotion. And the premise of guru devotion is basically you're trying to build a bridge between you and the Buddha or a gateway. And you're choosing this person as your gateway or your bridge to the divine and used to accessing the divine through that bridge or gateway, eventually it doesn't even matter who the person is. They could wind up having lesser qualities than even you. They could wind up being completely corrupt. And it doesn't matter if you've developed the skill set of being able to tap into the divine. But in the beginning, you're very vulnerable and you're very fragile and you need a solid, reliable person who has very stable ethics and a non-reactive mind. But as you become more mature as a spiritual practitioner, those things are less important for your access to things that open your heart. You know, and then, or it could be something like you have a guru and then they die and that doesn't change the relationship. You know, they're dead. It doesn't change the relationship because what you were connecting with was really in a way, a deeper part of you. Maybe it's even safer. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. But, you know, it does have to start with a real relationship and then it evolves into something that doesn't need to be as human relational and ordinary as it began as. And yet it still very much helps to have a person, you know, like a real fleshy one, what you can talk to you know, 
But what's interesting is that if you develop a strong guru devotion relationship with one person, and then you have other people with similar qualities, you can start to hear your own teacher through them and connect with your own teacher through them. Even if you only see your own teacher once a year, once every three years, you know, it's very deep what you're touching into. And a lot of it is your own capacity to hear wisdom more than reaching out for something. Do you know what I mean? Like instead of chasing this person or this ideal, what you're doing is trying to go deeper and deeper into your own ability to hear what is true. So who you wind up picking often has something in common with you, even if it's not obvious on the surface, there's something similar about their presenting learning style or their presenting personality type. Um, you'll notice that students of the same teacher might have similar kinds of afflictions as well as similar kinds of qualities. Um, you know, and then you'll get someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama who has, you know, thousands and thousands of students and what can you point to is the common thread besides some karmic connection. But, you know, I'm trying to think of my first guru moment was just hearing about him. And maybe it was for a lot of you as well. You know, I, I heard the words Dalai Lama when I was like four years old or something, you know, and all I knew was he lost his country and he wasn't angry and he didn't kill mosquitoes. That is all I knew because <laughs> I was four, you know, and that is all I knew for years and years. And that was enough and then I, you know, I met him in what, like 2006 or something, and it didn't actually feel hugely different than the conversation I'd been having with him in my head all those years. So what was I actually talking to? You know, was I just talking to myself, but my less afflicted self? And this external figure was somehow like a touchstone or a light to shine my own wisdom back on myself. So it's an interesting examination because you do need a person, but how you relate to them is really the issue. I, I was trying to think of a good analogy and, you know, and I, I think about this story a lot from a couple years ago where I was watching fireworks with a family my, um, my friend from high school and her husband and her children, we were all watching fireworks, you know, a couple years ago when I was visiting home. And the baby couldn't quite cope with looking at the fireworks. The fireworks were too intense for the baby. You know, she was kind of like dissociative and she wouldn't look and we'd kind of say, look, at, look, baby, look, fireworks. And she was just like, it was too much. But then the baby was looking at my face and laughing and laughing at my face. And I was trying to figure out why is she laughing at my face? And it was because the light from the fireworks was bouncing off my face in the dark. And so she could see the fireworks on me, but she couldn't see them in the sky. And I was thinking the fireworks are like the Buddhas. And for us, it's sort of too far away. It's too intense. It's too bright. But we can talk to someone in front of us and see that light reflected on them even though they didn't even make it necessarily. And, you know, we're like the baby <laughs> that can only relate to the flickers of light across the face. And yet we're still accessing some divinity there. The danger is then thinking that that person that you see the fireworks on is the creator of the fireworks. And then if they do something that is confusing to your mind or destructive, then you can no longer touch fireworks because you think they made them. So, I mean, use whatever analogy you like. They sometimes say, you know, the guru is like, or the, you know, the guru is like the magnifying glass and the Buddhas are like the sun. And the, you know, the guru is able to direct the light of the Buddhas to you in this intense form, which sounds a little bit alarming as well. Like you'll be fried up like an ant on the sidewalk, but you know, it's directing the gaze of the sun in this direct pinpointed way. So what you're looking for in a guru is someone who is ethical and more educated than you. That's the main thing. And they're ethical and more educated than you in a long-term consistent way that you've watched over time. 
and that perhaps other people have watched over time and have sort of vetted. You know, so there's no weird scandals. There's not like, you know, I don't know, sexual misconduct or financial misconduct or a history of them losing their temper in a really aggressive way. There's not that kind of stuff. And they, you know, they seem to not be chasing financial gain. They seem to not care so much about fame or reputation. I mean, just classic common sense things. So when you're looking for a guru, it doesn't have to be like the clouds part and the angels sing. And, you know, it's don't look for that. You're looking for a deep familiarity and a deep resonance with the way they present truth is a way I can hear truth. And I can hear my own wisdom more deeply when they are in front of me. That's what you're looking for. And then you gradually build this relationship and eventually you say, can I be your student? And you can ask up to three times. And if they say no three times, well then move on. And they're just your Dharma friend, <laughs> right? But there are a lot of people out there who are qualified to be a sutra level guru. Um, a tantra level guru is another thing and that's worth just waiting, but a sutra level guru, there, there are lots of people that are qualified to be that. You know, Sangha Kadro is qualified to be that. Venerable Rabin is qualified to be that. So, you know, these are, these are people that are very human and real and have, you know, human characteristics that you can relate to, maybe even characteristics that confuse you, but they know the things that you need in order to tap into your own wisdom and develop it. So when you think about, you know, a guru, does it have to be an old Tibetan man? <laughs> you know, sometimes it's nice. And, you know, to be honest, all of my gurus are old Tibetan men. Uh, one of them is middle-aged, but they're all men who are Tibetan, except for one who is a very old English lady, you know, Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo. But, you know, it's like what are we looking for in these old Tibetan men? We're looking for qualities, scholarship, and practice. We're not looking for exotic. We're not looking for because a different race than therefore somehow superior because these are a superior creature or something. You know, you're not getting into kind of weird spiritual materialism. You're recognizing that the Tibetans have held the Dharma very purely and perfectly for, you know, a thousand years. And so percentage wise, they've got more qualified gurus. But it doesn't, you know, don't trap yourself into thinking that I don't get any Tibetan lamas in Israel. So that means I can't have a guru. Or that if you don't see them that often, that, that it doesn't work. You could see them once a year. It could be a traveling teacher like Ling Rinpoche or His Holiness or Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And they can, you can still have a daily relationship with them, even if they're not in your face all the time. Is it, is it making sense or is it more confusing? Do you... I, this whole guru uh, topic is very intriguing. It's interesting and appealing and also... Um... I don't know, the opposite of appealing, frightening, and um, and a lot of the time last semester I felt like it, it keeps me away from the Dharma, not only because I don't have access, as Nomi said, this may be one reason, but it's not the main one for me, but we have, I don't know, it, it triggers us or me in a way. Uh, to have no doubt or to look at someone without, not to look up to someone, because that I think we do all the time uh, to our teachers, to our supervisors, um, to our analysts, to a lot of people. I don't think we have, I don't have a problem with looking up to, but to have no doubt. Um, and Amy stressed that a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the issue of, not having a doubt. And one sentence she said that uh, triggered me the most was, if you don't have a go, you can't uh, get on with the path. You get stuck. So that triggered, the, it hit the competitive or the ambitious uh, part in me. And I said, well, what's, 
<laughs> what am I going to do <laughs> without a guru now? <laughs> but you are saying something different about the guru. You don't, you, you see it differently or you say it differently. Um, that it doesn't have to be someone huge or out of reach or even traditionally someone that I have to go for a journey to look for. Yeah, maybe he will come to me, N not looking for me, but you know, comes along my, my way. Um, it, it's a different uh, way of thinking to go look for something or to meet a guru and then to meet the Dharma through him or to meet the Dharma and then go and find my guru. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little chicken or egg. Yeah, it's different. So can you say something about that? Well, what I'm guessing that Venerable Amy was talking about is once you've made the commitment to not nourish doubt. You know, it's not like you don't have doubt, but it's that you're, you've made a decision. You've decided this person is the mouthpiece for the Buddha, for the Buddhas, for you specifically and personally. And so what you want to do is to really check, can I hear them as the mouthpiece of the Buddha with enough consistency that my practice will not be disturbed if they're having an off day, <laughs> you know? And what is an off day anyway? And how much is that is my own projection? And what am I even looking for? Because can you even see perfection when it's in front of you if you've got all of your own delusions as the filtration system? The Buddha could be right in front of you and you wouldn't see him as the Buddha because we don't have the karma to see that kind of purity. And again and again, we see in the Dharma, you cannot take another person's measure. You can't, you know, you, who is to say who in the group is a Buddha and who isn't, you know, it could be that none of us people are Buddhas, but like our house pets are, because at least through them, we cultivate generosity, creating the causes for resources in the future. You know, and that all, you know, so there's our pet, just like doing pet things. But in reality, there's a Buddha there. And because of them, at least we create positive karma of generosity. So what you're doing is you're saying, what is what does the Buddha say in terms of characteristics that are enough characteristics to say this person is going to be my go to mouthpiece for the Buddhas. And so in the Lam Rim, it says very specifically what to look for. And basically, the three higher trainings are the minimum. Yeah. So in the, in the Ten Teaching Sutra, it says, develop the following ideas with respect to your teachers. I have wandered for a long time through cyclic existence, and they search for me. I have been asleep, having been obscured by delusion for a long time, and they wake me. They pull me out of the depths of the ocean of existence. I have entered a bad path, and they reveal the good path to me. They release me from being bound in the prison of existence. I have been worn out by illness for a long time, and they are my doctors. They are the rain clouds that put out my blazing fire of attachment and the like. And so Maitreya says that a student relies on a teacher who has these 10 qualities, and then later it says, if you can't find someone with these 10 qualities, at least these first three, meaning discipline, serene, thoroughly pacified, ethical discipline, meditative concentration, and wisdom. Now, of course, a wealth of scriptural knowledge is very, very important. Knowledge of reality, theoretically, they've realized emptiness directly, or at least have the correct philosophical understanding and good qualities surpassing those of the student that you, you know, you make an educated guess they seem to have, right? And then the looking after others, they're skilled in instructing their disciples. They possess loving concern, they're energetic, and they've abandoned dispiritedness, meaning they never get tired of giving an explanation again and again. They bear the hardships of explaining. So the Buddha said someone with these qualities is suitable to rely upon, meaning you can hear the Buddha through them, whether they're a Buddha or not. You're choosing to see them as the Buddha, particularly when they're teaching the Dharma, 
and you're trying to see them as the Buddha giving you personal advice. And what happens when you adopt that attitude is you hear personal advice. And it, it's happened to me a million times. I can't even tell you what a difference it makes in a teaching if you decide the Buddha is talking to you through this person, as opposed to just hearing it as general knowledge. When you think, no, it's not even just general and good for me and I should take it personally and apply it to my life in this kind of like gently titrated way. When you think, no, this person is talking to me as an individual, even though there's a thousand under other individuals here you will hear something that is so specific to your life. You'll be shocked and wonder, do other people know that he's talking to me? Because that was really personal. You know, it happens if you think in that way. Because remember, the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas pervades every atom of existence. The Buddhas are here. We don't have to invite them. We invite them or we invoke them or we talk to a teacher to create access and receptivity. We're not chasing anything. They're already here. What we're trying to do is create openness and receptivity to hear the fact that we're being flooded with compassionate wisdom constantly. So once you choose somebody to be the mouthpiece for the Buddha for you, it's important not to have doubt. You know, it's not that you won't have doubt. It's that you're trying not to nurture your doubt. You know, can you feel the difference? So it's not like you're kind of like disassociated from the fact that sometimes you wonder, you know, like my abbot who I think is amazing and I don't even know what his qualities are, but I know that they're amazing, amazing qualities. And you've met my teacher. He's, he's beautiful and he's hilarious and he's, you know, all of these things. And sometimes I would come up to his house to like, I don't know, take out the garbage and he'd be like watching Mr. Bean <laughs> and I would have doubt. And I would think the Buddha is watching Mr. Bean confusing. What is the Buddha trying to teach me through watching Mr. Bean? Maybe he's trying to teach me that rest is important and humor is important. Maybe he's trying to teach me this and this and this and this. And I would do all of this mental gymnastics. And then I just let it go and thought, maybe he's just a human being who wants to watch stupid television. And that does not negate the fact that the Buddha is also there. You know, like I could tie myself in knots trying to interpret and interpret and interpret every sort of thing. And a lot of people do that. Or you could just say, maybe it's a, just a regular person there doing regular things. And still the Buddha is also there in the space that they occupy trying to talk to me. Or that person right there is in fact literally a Buddha. And all of these ordinary behaviors are to be relatable and are trying to teach me something specifically. And either way of thinking can be useful, but I have to remember that the practice is mine. I'm not trying to prove anything to them. They don't need my devotion. The devotion is to create receptivity because we become open to what we respect. So if you're elevating something, something is higher, you lean in and you listen more deeply than usual. And then it goes in more deeply and it digests more quickly. You know, it's, it's very effective psychology for integrating the Dharma quickly. So, I mean, I feel like my relationship with my teachers has developed directly related to my faith in the Dharma and my own ability to change. And the deeper the faith in myself, the closer my connection with my teachers, whether they're physically with me or not. You know, I sort of feel the guru-ness and then I can start to hear them in everything. And there's, you know, Lama Zopa Rinpoche would say, every statue, every tanka, every text is the guru, you know? And so then you pick up this book, you open it at random, and you think, the guru is telling me what? And you might open it up to the exact page that you need on that day. Or it could be completely coincidental, and any dharma would be useful if you took it to heart. You know, and so this is the question where we have to kind of dance between am I choosing to take things as a teaching or am I feeling that teachings are being bestowed upon me? Am I making a plan for my life or am I feeling like a plan is being offered to me? And which is a more empowered stance and which is more affected for me? And I would argue that it's much more effective to say, 
there are teachings being flooded to me constantly, but I have to decide how quickly, what pace to take them. So whether something is a teaching for me or not is my decision. I think if we, uh, we take it, uh, maybe I understood what you're saying, you correct me. I think maybe if we take the guru as a self-object, but with a different emphasis, I mean, Iris said, uh, I think before she said, she mentioned, uh, she said something like, if he knows me well enough, like in a personal way, I think here it's a self-object relation idealized self-object relation, but I think you have to do, to be active in finding what the things that are being see, uh, said to you, you have to find what are they referring to. Because if you're opening a book and you say exactly where I am, so you did something active to accept what we would call merger. You are merging up to, you're letting the self-object uh, a spiritual or inspiration or whatever to come into you. So I think it's like the guru is a kind of self-object relation, but you have to do something. It's not personalized. It's not, we used to be very personal, very personal, you know, in a treatment or something like this. This is bigger and you have to do something active to accept the material. Then it will become personalized, something like this. I think. Yeah, yeah. And you can, I mean, you can look at it like the way some people who are very religious, there's a kind of a, an immature view of God and a more mature view of God, right? The immature view of God is like a paternalistic father figure personified person that is telling you what to do in an authoritarian way. And a more sophisticated view of God is that he is love. And without gender or personality or whatever, that it is just, you know, love or compassion. And what you're relating to in other people is their love and compassion and divine spark or whatever. You know, that there's maybe as a child, you need to think of God as a person. And then as you become older, you understand conceptually what is divine. What does it mean to access those incredibly profound qualities that very ordinary people contain? You know, and of course, in Buddhism, we don't even talk about God, but it's a similar thing with the guru, where in the beginning, it's a person that you talk to. And as you grow and mature as a spiritual practitioner, it's a deeper and deeper inner conversation that less and less needs a specific human to bounce off of. You know, so it evolves in that way. So, you know, I don't, I don't want His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, to die ever, but I will not lose him when he does because I'm talking to him in my heart, you know? It's like whatever qualities he represents for me, whatever wisdom he evokes for me is something that over however many 20 years of connecting to him as my guru, it's, it's like that those qualities are integrated enough that I can tap back into him through his previous recordings, through his books, through memories of him, you know, and it's, the inner guru is awake enough to hear him when I'm listening. So I'm just developing my listening qualities. That's my practice of guru yoga is to listen even deeper and deeper and deeper because there's this, there is this divinity always talking to you, always talking to us. But you know, how do we even define that? But you know, those moments of awe or wonder or, very, very deep connection that go beyond words that you don't have to be religious or spiritual to experience, you know, just deep, deep, deep human connection, whatever that ability to connect with depth, that's the quality that we're trying to, you know, cultivate with the guru devotion relationship. So it's, it's very important in the path to have a spiritual mentor, but it doesn't have to be this now it's you and me forever thing right away. You can check your teacher for 12 years before making that commitment. You know, lots of modern people think, oh, 12 hours is enough. You know, it's like, it's a far more important relationship than marriage. Don't jump into it. You know, find a few candidates and think about them a lot. And, you know, it's like, 
if his holiness works for you, if Lama Zopa works for you, whoever it is, even if you don't meet them, think about them a lot, be proactive. What are they waking up in you? And over time, it might be that then the connection happens. But you know, you can't just kind of be passive and wait for it to happen. You're, you're listening for guruness all over the place. I hope, I hope that makes sense. know whether they can or they can't is you know the thing is is that like Lama Zopa Rinpoche has a very mystical yogi quality and that style really suits some people you know he is far out like he is a, not a normal person and I love him so much I can't even tell you how much I love him and when you're in class with him it's not linear you know it's not outlined it's not a geshe teaching it's it's very experiential and visceral and a little bit magic. And I personally would go crazy if he was my only teacher. You know, it would be like, all right, that is all amazing, but what do I do tomorrow? <laughs> you know, like, uh, 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 you know? And, you know, my own heart teacher is very concrete and very step-by-step -step and also very mystical and very magical and absurd and silly and funny because that's what I like. <laughs> You know, like the, the guru that you choose is going to be the learning style that you favor. Qualified guru has ethics, has concentration, has wisdom. They all have that. But in terms of the style, it's totally related to your own receptivity and what you like. Because, you know, who you pick as a guru, that's what you're going to be like when you grow up. So it's got to be already kind of in alignment with your style. You know? So, so don't worry, you know, <laughs> so don't worry is, is, is the thing. And I guess very raw relative truth devotion, not remembering emptiness, if you can do it, is very efficient and you get a lot of work done if you have that kind of level of devotion. But if you have, um, I don't know, a critical streak or a cynical streak or a trauma in your past or whatever stuff that just makes you not able to go there, that doesn't mean you can't have a guru. It's just that style of devotion isn't your style of devotion. No problem. Yeah, you know, I appreciate, I, I appreciate a guru who will mock me and tease me and show me the way that I'm absurd. But for some people that would be too painful and they don't want to be teased and they don't want people to tell them how they're silly and ridiculous and full of contradictions and, you know, hypocrisy. I like that. I find it quite fun. But, you know, it's like you, it's not like those are the qualities everyone needs for a guru. That's just what I like, you know. So when I met my teacher and he made fun of me, I laughed at myself and thought, he's the one, <laughs> you know. So slowly, slowly, but um, I guess you just have to have really wide open ears. And I'm not really talking about ears. You know, you just have to listen so deeply for who wakes up your wisdom. 
So I, I wanted to read you guys this prayer. It's one of my favorite prayers. And I think I've read it to you before, but it's called calling the guru from afar. And I think it will help, under, help us kind of understand this topic a bit better. So I'm going to um, pop it on the screen. Hope Lama, think of me. Lama, think of me. Lama, think of me. The wisdom of all Buddhas, one taste with the Dharmakaya, is itself the ultimate nature of all kind Lamas. I beseech you, Lama Dharmakaya, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives in the bardo. Wisdom's own illusory appearance, the conqueror with seven branches, is itself the ultimate basis of emanation of all kind Lamas. I beseech you, Lama Sambhogakaya, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives in the bardo. The play of various emanations, suiting the dispositions of the many to be subdued, is itself the behavior of the Sambhogakaya of the Kain Lamas. I beseech you, Lama Nirmanakaya, please guide me always without separation, in this life, future lives in the bardo. The play of the inseparable three Kayas, appearing in the form of the Lama, is itself one with the very essence of all Kain Lamas. I beseech you, Lama, the inseparable three Kayas, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. All the infinite peaceful and wrathful yidams are also the Lama's nature. And since no yidam exists apart from the kind Lama, I beseech you, Lama, who comprises all yidams, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. The ordinary form of all Buddhas arises in the aspect of the Lama. Therefore, no Buddhas are observed apart from the kind Lama himself. I beseech you, Lama, who comprises all Buddhas, please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, in the bardo. The very form of all conquerors' wisdom, compassion, and power arises as the Lama. Therefore, the supreme Arya lords of the three types are also the kind Lama himself. I beseech you, Lama, who combines three families in one. Please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. The hundred, five, and three types, however many are elaborated, are the Lama. The pervasive master in whom they are all included is also the Lama. I beseech you, Lama, as master of all the types. Please guide me always without separation in this life, future lives, and the bardo. Therefore, Lama, please bless me to generate in my mental continuum effortless experience of the profound three principles of the path and the two stages. Please bless me to strive in one-pointed practice of the three trainings with the intense thought of renunciation in order to re-keep the secure state of liberation. Please bless me to train in the precious Supreme Bodhicitta with special attitude, taking responsibility to liberate all migrators by myself alone. Please bless me to follow after the ocean of conquerors with the will to cross to the very end of the great waves of deeds of the conqueror's sons. Please bless me to realize the supreme view free of extremes in which emptiness and dependent arising, appearance and emptiness complement each other. Please bless me to meet the ultimate Lama, the bare face of my innate mind, with the covering of perception of true existence and perceiving it as true removed. Think of me. So the ultimate definitive Lama, the bare face of my innate mind. Okay. So just be in this listening aspect, which you already are in so many ways with your clients, but even this deeper listening, which is trying to hear Dharma in whatever form as personal advice and just kind of see what happens in terms of your relationship with your inner guru. Okay, and we'll um, flesh it out a little bit more next week. Yidam is your own personal meditational deity. Okay, so I'll see you guys a little bit later today. And um, just...